For the next 15 minutes, we're going to have the chance to sort of interrogate what we've, what we've heard in the first session. And I, I wanted to start with uh, the first thing we heard, with the, with the story that uh, Stephen uh, recited is the wrong word. You recite the poetry, you deliver, you perform the story that Stephen performed. There we go, I found the right word, finally. Um, and what struck me about that story is that it hit the, the, it hit the key formal problem around which questions about liminality and liminality in the body um, orbit, which is this, this permanent and irresolvable tension between euphoria and horror. Mm -hmm. That you escape the body and that is euphoric, but losing the body is horrific. You want to escape the mortal body, but you're going to do that when you die anyway. So you're, you're, you're reaching for the thing that you're most terrified of. So I wondered... Um, as you develop these fictions, as you explore the liminal in your work, whether this formal problem speaks to you or... Yeah, so I think, I, th I mean, in that particular story, I think the, the sort of euphoria and horror bit that you're talking about, I think a lot of, a lot of the... So there's a lot of different things that prompted that, that story, one of which was, that, was the sort of that attachment to technology, that attachment, the, the, the desire to sort of escape into the digital world, if you like, and, and all that sort of stuff, and at the same time hating that connection, but sort of not being able to get away from it, and, and, and I think there was a lot of that uh, behind that. Um, I think in some other stuff I've done, the whole, I mean, you mentioned transhumanists, that is an absolutely fascinating as a, as a writer to, to delve into some of some of that so the sort of um, the desire to uh, upload your brain into a computer and therefore live forever and actually when you talk to people about what that might be like that's where you get the sort of horror of wow ah, living forever it's like, well, why would I want to do that and it's it's, it's just uh, yeah I find it a really fascinating tension as you say uh, Sylvia, one of the striking things about the, the Kendrick, the, your analysis of the Kendrick piece and the, and the, the film itself, is that it, it captures that distinction between looking and looking for something. And I just wondered whether this distinction of the way of looking is more useful to you than the usual descriptions of that instrumentality and medical thinking and objectivity in science versus art, all those sort of packed down rather nicely in your practice to ways of looking. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered whether, um, well, how did you come across Kendrick? I mean, you know, this is a yeah. good place to start. No, that's a very good start. question because I, I was doing a lot of work uh, and a lot of research investi investigating how you know, um, contemporary artists were, you know, using um, brain images most of all, or, you know, the, the, the kind of tools of neurosciences. And I was actually not very satisfied somehow <laughs> with uh, what I was uh, coming across with. Um, I, uh, and, and then I, I just loved actually Kentridge's work, and I realized that he did use in different, uh, you know, uh, in different on different occasions, he did make use of, of brain scans and of medical imagery in uh, at a time in which, uh, um, you know, um, somehow the use of brain scans was not that prominent yet in the art world, and he was not also involved in any formal institutional institutional collaborative uh, work with the scientists. So that was also interesting to me. Um, although now he's kind of also collaborating with, uh, with scientists or historians of science. Um, so this is uh, really, I kind of thought that he was actually touching upon what was really at stake with this kind of uh, cutting edge technologies, but in a way that yeah, had to do with the exploration of really the, also the notion of the uncanny in a way that we mentioned somehow, like the, really the, the kind of Freudian notion of the uncanny and, and the, 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 this kind of idea of, yeah, um, 
we are uh, somehow yeah looking at something and trying to read uh, what uh, we are looking at uh, but then somehow we have to also somehow be able to leave ourselves somehow behind and I, I think I was interested in his work because I think to me he was able to leave this idea that we are our brains so he was able to leave the concept of brainhood, that we really are our brains, that what we do is always somehow motivated and driven by our brains, but without you know, uh, dismissing you know, the, the, uh, the neurosciences, but really somehow trying to uh, suggest a, a notion of, um, of really um, embodied somehow uh, perception as well, embodied uh, uh, neuroscience at a time in which it was really not uh, uh, so much uh, 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 really discussed about, at least by our, among artists. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it just strikes me to buy that, that question of the, that distinction between looking and looking for is, is writ large in the holodeck. You know, one, one wonders why they ever cooked up that idea because that is a machine that desperately needs to be looking for something and it is actually just looking, it's, it's, it's purely experiential. So, um, is, is the liminal future then an entirely immersive entertainment in that kind of Stanislav Lem style why way? Do, I don't know about that, I think there's a there's a the the holodeck as a place where you reproduce an ideal is interesting and it ties into um, it ties into the growth of vaporwave as a as a subcultural movement and there's been some really great writing about why vaporwave exists you know this repurposing and reusing and destruction of you know Tina Turner clips and 80s movies and stuff and it co it comes from this I wrote this really horrible paragraph about like we're on like Taylor Swift's third album named after the 80s and we're on a 25th Avengers movie like there's a there's a lack of um, what would normally be considered social democratic western progress that we recycle yeah. trying to get back to a time where things made sense in like this strange um, 80s things and I, my one of my concerns is that culture is just kind of well, western culture is just kind of eating itself in this cycle of trying to find this perfection that we want so, or this this power that we once had over the world through which was in the 80s where things things felt directed and powerful even if that was misguided in the first place so i don't know if it's yeah. immersive but there's no one like burying heads in the sand yeah 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 questions <laughs> i thought i gave you enough time that's the last time i do you any famous <laughs> um yes yes hello uh, So they're inheriting that. Um, uh, there's a great, if you're interested, there's a fantastic researcher, a doctor as of two weeks ago, Ramon Amaro, who's actually based out of Goldsmiths as well, who's done this fantastic work about how um, the work, uh, th there was a mathematician called Leibniz, he worked two, three hundred years ago, something like that, and he developed these theories of like, there's a lot of those mathematicians did, maths and science was about getting closer to God, and in th this version of Christianity, the white man was perfect and everything else was somehow fallen. And so that Leibniz established a lot of the mathematical principles that later went into building the first algorithms, doing the first predictive analytics. And so Ramana Mara builds this brilliant chain from Leibniz's Western colonial racism to the uh, Amazon predictive shopping algorithm. They're all descended from the same chain of reason, right? And it's the same kind of pervasive sense and there's the, you know this is why it's interesting to look at the work of um, decolonialization across the fields whether it's in maths or science or arts or whatever because they're basically saying let's reappraise this history let's go right back to 
four or five hundred years ago, which may seem like a long way away, but realize that the effects of the knowledge that was produced in that period still hang over what we have today. So that's why Hewlett Packard, who aren't you know, a maliciously racist company, but they invent a camera that doesn't realize that black bodies exist. Because it just wasn't factored in the, in the chain of scientific work that led to the production of that technology to that point. You know, and it's Kodak's another example. Kodak, when they were producing the film, the, the white balance for analog film is based in the chemical of the film rather than in the setting. And so they didn't have, in the, when they were first producing their consumable films in the 70s and 80s for people to take holiday snapshots, they were imbalanced for black skin. It's not that Kodak were racist, it's just that, well, they were only racist as far as the entirety of society is racist. So it's one of those things where you, one of the examples I use with students a lot is the, the phone. We all accept this now as the de facto form of the phone, but this descends from uh, a culture of the 70s where men design things to go in men's pockets. And now we're stuck with this. No one's ever, you don't think about that as being sexist, but it's part of that heritage of thought that was never questioned. Of course, it's massively ageist as well, yeah. as anyone with dry skin will testify. And handlist. <laughs> and handlist. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about this, this question of ageism as well, because you, you're talking about um, culture getting recycled in this, you know, in this uncanny way. I mean, it's, des it's so desperately trying not to be uncanny that it's massively uncanny. Um, it, it seems to me that a lot of what you're talking about is also freezing bodies, not recognizing that bodies develop. And to a degree, you can understand where that comes from. That comes from a completely de different demographic to the one we have now. There didn't used to be that many old people struggling with the packets. <laughs> now it's going to be half the population can't get into the smoke paddock. And it's a really, really frightening situation we have in which a world is designed for bodies of 30, not bodies of 70. Active minds, you know, active creative minds of 70, you can't get into the packets because the... the because it's designed for people with, with great dexterity. So, please. Yes. Okay. Um, just in kind of response to what you've been saying, but also I thought it was a very good, coherent um, you know, thesis about the relationship between maybe science and culture, right? And that idea that you're inheriting um, intellectual decisions that were made a long time ago. And I don't think people realize how many of the kind of cutting edge algorithms that everyone gets excited about have an intellectual history that does directly go back, you know, to the 17th century. You know, it's the same thing in economics. Um, it's exactly the same thing, but more so in economics, I would say. Um, so you have this intellectual history, and it's good to, I think it's very good to highlight that. But then you also have this challenge as to can you ever break out of that intellectual history, genuinely? Because if you're critiquing it from the outside as a cultural phenomenon, that's one thing. But how do you actually challenge and provoke the, you know, scientists and people in a meaningful way to actually question it rather than just because the risk is you just you just you're just kind of the wash, yeah, you know, the top of this tide of that's continued, right? It's interesting, that, isn't it? Like, so it makes me think of an artist called um, uh, 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 an artist based in Copenhagen, but she's um, from um, South. I think she's from South Africa. She's um, called Tabitha Rosaire, and she's trying to re describe the internet not as a place of disruption, as Silicon Valley tells us, but as a place of healing. So she's trying to spin this narrative of what if the internet is, is part of a healing culture, not a disruption culture. But then I had this debate with her, like how do you stop just being someone who stands outside Google and goes, you're bad? You know, and, and then we get into an argument about institutional politics, like what if she worked at Google, would that change her or would that change the institution? I don't, I don't know, maybe you know, from collaborating across these fields. Well, so I've been doing some collaboration across there. I'm not saying that this is this solves it at all. So <laughs> don't get me don't get me wrong. But it's been, I've been working with uh, scientists uh, in robot labs, neuroscience labs. Uh, what else have we done? Uh, geriatric uh, cognition, evolutionary biology, a whole whole lot of different different things, and going in as writers talking, observing, being around, and then writing a piece of fiction based, based on, on, on that, sort of always a sort of near future, slightly dark, um, and then having public events where the writers and the scientists are sitting on the same platform, engaging with an audience about this piece of fiction. And as I say, I'm not saying that solves it, 
But what it does do, or what it has done, is, and some of the scientists have said this, that it's actually made them look at what they're doing in a completely different way, and look at it in a much broader, almost stepping outside of their niche and going, oh, is that how this could all play out? That's you know, making them sound really stupid, but they're not. But it, it just helps them come out. So I'm not sh I don't think that, you know, that, that's still probably a bit of wash along over the top, but it's, it's been very interesting to see, to see that. Certainly, so the, the, the really striking image you had of that, that first scanner in an art gallery, do you think that art can do what Stephen's talking about, or do the institutions, <coughs> I sometimes get the feeling that the, 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 the institutions of art weigh very heavily on that dialogue, and it makes that dialogue quite, quite difficult. I just yeah. yeah, I've been involved in, in, in quite a few projects um, that you know are in between art and science, or that so the collaboration between artists and scientists. That um, the problem is always for me to kind of see where the money comes from to finance yeah. these projects. This is really the first thing, unfortunately. And as we know, being a you know a researcher in the humanities and in the social sciences too, but I mean it's very hard to get funding. Um, to actually start off a collaboration that is not funded by, you know, the, the very same bodies or by, you know, by like public engagement fund uh, that are often attached to these kind of very um, massive big science projects like the one that I'm involved in right now. Um, I'm a little bit more somehow critical in a sense uh, in terms of you know the openness of scientists towards you know collaborating with artists. I think there's very often the risk of actually just you know at least for, for the physicists that you know I've been working with, it's sometimes hard to kind of um, convince them that it's not about public engagement basically. Yeah. So because they are still very much expecting to see that. Um, I think in Aberdeen, uh, um, at least they have this kind of um, tradition, really, of working hands-on, really, and of really not relying upon external manufacturers, for instance, for the construction of those kind of technologies. So they have the sensibility of designers and of engineers. So I think that that's, you know, somehow a bridge between the two communities. Um, and I'm going actually, uh, together with the Saudi Arts Centre, I'm going to uh, launch uh, an artist in residence. Um, so um, we will see what happens. This um, is all the time we have for questions, horrifically, though I'm sure, you know, obviously, now I've said that, everyone's got a question, <laughs> and we can deal with that at the end of the session, but you have to, you have to work for the privilege, because, um, not, Sorry, this is going to come out really badly. I was about to say, you're going to have to work for the privilege because Steve is about to perform a new short story, which is not what I meant at all. Um, Stephen will be, um, uh, will be performing another piece, but then you do have to work for your money because um, Julie Light and Jill Muller uh, will be getting you to finish the fiction or explore the liminal for yourselves and to share those stories and share those ideas and see if we can finally step over the threshold. So, with apologies for some really appalling... That's <laughs> fine, that's fine. <laughs> some, some truly appalling segue there. Stephen, thank you. <laughs> this next story is called I Want to Be Pure for Him. The morning sun streams through the cracks in the blinds, soft and comforting, the exact opposite of how I'm feeling. I woke up convinced that the room was full of chattering people, but the only person in the room is lying next to me, a beautiful and wonderful rabbi. It's another day of therapy, and a flock of ghosts are clinging to the inside of my skull, refusing to be expunged. I hate it when our bedroom's invaded like this, spoiling the haven of love we've built up over the three intense months we've been together. And yet, the more I tr try to think only of Rabbi, the more the memories of past lovers occupy my dreams. He moves in his sleep, pulling the duvet tighter. I want to know him better, to know him as much 
if not more, than the others. But we've agreed there are no shortcuts. Time and time alone builds what we want. A memory of a stolen kiss tugs at the periphery of my brain. I know it isn't real, that it's someone else's, a snippet of a past lover grafted onto my soul. Intimacy with your lover on a scale previously impossible. That was the promise of my first time when I was 17. Madly in love, maybe lust, and very drunk. I remember thinking, why not? I ached to know him better. Him, Kale. I'll never forget him. The first of many, but the first. Special. It was relatively new back then. It took a whole day in an immersive VR lab. We each worked with the programmers, recreating important episodes from our past, ready for the immersion. I remember feeling an incredible sense of apprehension as they warned me that it might be irreversible and could occasionally tr trigger mental problems. I didn't care. It was exhilarating to think that the man I was head over heels in love with, the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, was bearing himself for me, lay laying down the experience that made him who he was, coded into IVR so I could be immersed in them, in him. Kale's memories became mine, and mine his. What could have been more intimate? The edges between us blurred, and we understood each other in a way I'd never thought I could. It was wonderful, although sometimes we had the most horrendous disagreements, both of us claiming ownership of the memory, the trauma, and how it changed us. I hated that part of it, not knowing what was real and what was false. But most of the time it was incredible. It was so special for a while, a few weeks. But then Kale was unfaithful. His argument that I knew exactly what childhood event had led to this inevitable betrayal didn't make it any easier. In some ways it made it worse because I knew how much the affair meant to him. And he knew how much it hurt me. We split up and a whole string of short-lived encounters followed. Quite a few, too many, were so jealous of the empathy I had with Kale that they insisted on the same. My head filled with other people's memories and it became harder and harder to tell them apart. Exactly the opposite of what each of my jealous lovers were hoping for. So many arguments, so many misunderstandings. And then I met Rabbi. The man lying beside me now, gently snoring. Rabbi has never asked for the VR empathy. He's not jealous, or if he is, he keeps it quiet. He's private, a mystery, and I love it. We've set a wedding day. We're getting married. We're taking a risk. I'm having therapy to erase all of the false memories, steadily stripping away all that's not mine. But they're protesting. Those falsely implanted memories don't want to disappear. And as they go, I feel deprived. I grieve. This morning is particularly bad. They must be expelled. They have to go. Rabbi is stirring. I breathe deep breaths and think of the lazy days we've spent by the river, soaking up the sun and each other. I don't want him to see the pain I'm enduring. He opens his eyes. Morning, he says. Memories? I smile and kiss him. Not for much longer. So true. And then I'll have my very own pure and untainted lover. I kiss him again. He stares at me, a little longer than feels comfortable. I wonder if I'll like the new you, he says as he runs his fingers through my hair. I swallow. It's an unknown, a risk we're both taking. Of course you will. How could you not? There's sadness in his eyes. I hope so, he says. At least it'll be the real me. True, he says, and kisses me passionately.